Hey, hey, so <laughs> big news today. I guess it was yesterday's news, but I just found out of it that, about it today. Uh, somebody at the Supreme Court leaked a draft of an opinion by uh, Samuel Alito, and it indicates that the Supreme Court is likely to overturn Roe versus Wade. Now, for a lot of people, Roe versus Wade just means, you know, the right to an abortion. And, you know, rightfully so at some level, but, you know, the, there's, a, there's an argument and a sort of intellectual or intellectual current that, that says if Roe versus Wade is overturned, that's it. Abortion is then illegal in all the knuckle-dragging red states. They have all of these tripwire uh, bills and, and laws already in place saying that if Roe is ever overturned, then, you know, abortion automatically becomes illegal in those states. But as I understand it, and of course, I'm no legal scholar, but as I understand it, uh, Roe versus Wade, the decision, basically, the, the argument in favor of the plaintiff's you know, right to, to get an abortion, I don't know if she was actually the plaintiff or the defendant, but anyway, it came down to a matter of privacy. Now, there is no guarantee of privacy in the Constitution or in any of the amendments to the Constitution, although legal scholars would say that many of the amendments imply a right to privacy. You know, so your right to uh, practice whatever religion you want, in including no religion at all, uh, it, it implies that you, if you want to, can keep your religious sentiments private. Your uh, freedom from illegal search and seizure basically establishes your home as a preserve of, you know, your own privacy. Uh, you know, there, there are many other amendments and, and references in the Constitution that imply a right to privacy, even if no explicit right is, is spelled out. Well, what if it turns out that this, you know, right to privacy is not a very strong platform upon which to place the, um, you know, the right to an abortion? Now, okay, let me just stop and say, what, what are my feelings on abortion? Um, you know, my father asked me that once. He was a Rush Limbaugh fanatic, a ditto head, as they were called. Uh, he was a federal agent, you know, he very conservative. Uh, he, he wrote in George H.W. Bush for president, you know, when Ronald Reagan was running. He was, he was a fanatic for George Bush. So I figured, and he's Catholic, so I figured that uh, his, his stance on abortion was, you know, absolutely not. But he asked me, just out of the blue, we're driving, some, when we're driving one day, and he asked me, you know, what I thought of abortion. And I said, well, I think it's sometimes the least worst option. <laughs> You know, it, it is the option that causes the least grief, uh, but it's not good. And he agreed. <laughs> it was a very rare point of political or ideological agreement between my father and I. Of course, I was much younger at the time. And typically, you know, the younger you are, the more liberal. <laughs> That's such a, a debased word. It's really hard to use it and have it mean anything particular in particular at all. But anyway, I'm not a big fan of abortion. But at the same time, I think that making it illegal for poor and, you know, working class women, because rich women will always have the option of flying to some place where it is, you know, cheap and not cheap, but available, legal and safe, uh, legally safe, medically safe. It is poor women, women without much money, without the ability to travel, you know, with, without a lot of options who will be caught up in this abortion struggle. So I don't like abortion. Um, I don't like that the Democratic Party used to say that they wanted it to be uh, legal, safe, and rare, and then they dropped the rare. They just want it to be legal and safe, and they don't care how often it happens. You know, my perspective on it is largely, um, it's cruel to inflict prolonged pain and the fear of pain and suffering and death on a conscious entity. Uh, when a sperm fertilizes an egg, yes, it's alive, it's a biological entity, but it doesn't have, as far as I know, as far as I can tell, it doesn't have a sense of self, it doesn't have a mind, it doesn't have a brain, certainly, it doesn't have a heart. Um, it's, it's a mass of cells. At that stage, if you terminate its progression towards what it might become, I mean, yeah, you might be depriving the world of an Einstein or something, but you haven't caused a lot of suffering. There's nobody in the world who knows and is attached to this entity. Um, but then the longer you let it progress, the more it seems like a human, uh, the more it will suffer when you do take its life. 
and you know, let's <laughs> let's make no mistake, um, it is human. You, you might say it's not a person because a person is a legal term, but it's certainly human. It's not anything other than human. And an abortion does end a human life. It takes the life of somebody who has committed no crime. Now, again, this is, this is justifying why I don't like it. This is not an argument for saying that it should be illegal because something can be harmful and it's still possible that abolishing that thing or trying to, trying to prohibit it, would require so much force and so much intrusion into people's lives that the harm caused by trying to enforce the prohibition is worse than the thing that was being prohibited, which was admittedly bad. So that's very long-winded way of saying that sometimes trying to, you know, outlaw something it, that is bad is worse than just letting it happen. But I don't like it. Uh, so where are we going from here? Crystal Ball pointed this out on Breaking Points today. There have been multiple times when the Democrats controlled both the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the White House. And if they had wanted to at that time, they could have strengthened the legal right to an abortion at the federal level, and they chose not to. Why? Well, the constant fear that if those evil Republicans win the next election, they're going to strip you of your abortion rights, that is you know, that is a way to rally the troops. It is a way to instill fear. It is a way to demonstrate that, yes, even though we suck, we suck less than those guys because they want to take away your right to abortion. And they will, given the first opportunity. But, you know, when the Democrats are in a position to really reinforce that right in federal legislation, they don't. They're not interested. You know, they, they don't want a commanding lead in this contest because then people get complacent. They want fear. They want to instill and maintain that fear. What if we just amended the Constitution? Now, I know amending the Constitution is very difficult. We haven't done it in a very long time. It's, it's not uh, an easy thing to do. And you might even say that for all practical purposes is, you know, it's not possible. Uh, the, the legal pathway exists, but the hurdles are so high and our level of disagreement so vociferous at this point, you know, in our, our nation's history that we just couldn't agree on anything, you know, to the extent that we could pass a new constitutional amendment. But, you know, there is no explicit right to privacy in the Constitution. So basing the right to an abortion on the right to privacy is very shaky. It's always been very shaky. And it could be that, you know, Roe versus Wade was always doomed, that it was bad law from the get-go, you know, that it was, it was always a bad plan. And, you know, finally the day of reckoning seems to be here, but it, Nobody can be surprised by this. Nobody can, you know, I mean, surely they will, but the rending of the, the garments and the gnashing of the teeth and the wailing is not justified. <laughs> you know, this, this is a long time coming. What if there was a different principle, though? Not privacy, a different principle that we could appeal to, to say, well, this is why you can't tell a woman what to do with her body. In libertarianism, there is such a principle. It's called self-ownership. Your body is a physical object, but you, you are something else. You are not your body, but you own your body. It is your property to do with as you please. And unlike any other kind of property, it cannot be expropriated from you. It, as long as you are alive, the body, you know, that gives you life, that, that represents your life and your physical manifestation in this world is yours, cannot be taken from you. That would be the principle upon which you could abolish for all time involuntary servitude, you know, but right now the constitution doesn't recognize any right to self-ownership and neither does the larger society because other implications of self-ownership are you can end your life when you want to. That is not a right. You do not have that right. There are certain very progressive places, you know, like Oregon, where if a doctor, AKA a medical technocrat, decides that your life is no longer worth living, then you have the permission of the state to end your life with the doctor's assistance. But you don't have the right anywhere to do it yourself, to just make that decision, to make the call. You know what? This life is not worth living any longer. I think I'm out. Now, why don't we want that? I mean, some people do want that. People who are radical libertarians, they say, yes, people should be able to choose the time of their own part, you know, parting. Uh, as did, you know, Seneca, <laughs> who 
who followed up his own advice. He said, the wise man chooses the time of his own death, and he did. But as a culture, you know, even as much as we venerate Greek and, and Roman heritage, um, we don't follow the Greeks or the Romans in, in allowing people to determine when their life has come to an end. There are times, like teenagers, famously, you know, they're, they're in emotional turmoil because they're new to life and they have, their bodies are changing rapidly and they're feeling intense feelings. And, you know, if they feel rejected or hopeless or, you know, if they're in constant despair, they're more likely than other people to take their lives. Middle-aged and older men who no longer feel useful, who no longer feel capable of performing a useful role in their society or supporting their family, they are also very likely to take their lives. But for just about anybody who takes their life, there are other people who love them and will be hurt by that. And, you know, that would be one of the costs of self-ownership. That somebody that, who we thought definitely had something to live for, and we didn't want to grieve for their premature passing, you know, for our own selfish reasons, for our own emotional state, we didn't want to have to deal with their death when their death wasn't necessary. It was just a choice. Uh, you know, we would rather live, I guess, in a a world where we don't own our own bodies and where we don't own our own lives and where we don't have the right to say, I've had enough, I'm checking out. You know, we, we don't fight for that right for ourselves because we don't want to grieve for people who, you know, we're certain will make the wrong decision and take their life too early. All right. Um, Self-ownership. Give it some thought. I mean, is it something you would endorse that your body is your property, and you can dispose of your property as you see fit, including, you know, I, I, I really bristle at pro-abortion people who describe the fetus, call it a fetus, call it a zygote, call it whatever you want, but they describe it as a parasite. No, it's not a parasite. Yes, it is dependent on the mother, but a parasite is a different organism, and in that moment, you know, while the child, I'll call it a child, you call it whatever you want, while the child is still dependent upon being connected to its mother in order to continue growing, it's a part of the mother's body. You know, the mother supplied the egg. The egg, she was born with that egg. And yeah, a catalyst was introduced, a sperm cell, you know, with, with half the DNA that the, uh, the offspring will have. But that child is part of the mother until such time as it is born. And then it becomes an autonomous being. Now, you could say that there comes a time when it's viable, but it hasn't been born yet, and you could take it out. And yes, then when you take it out, it, it, is, it is its own thing. But up until that time, the child is part of the mother. If the mother owns her own body and has the right to dispose of her property as she sees fit, well, then, until the child is outside of her body and drawing breath on its own, and it is its own separate, freestanding, autonomous thing, it's part of her. And it's her right to dispose of part of her body if she wants to. Now, yeah. if you're passionate about your pro-life position, then this legal argument and, and equating a living, growing human being inside the womb of its mother as a piece of property to be disposed of as its owner sees fit, that's offensive to you. I mean, beyond offensive. To say that it's offensive is, is to hideously understate what you're probably feeling right now. But would that be any worse than the current situation from your perspective? You know, where the child just isn't anything. It isn't anything. <laughs> it's not a piece of property. It's not a living being. According to the law, it's, it's not uh, a person. It doesn't have rights. It doesn't have standing in court. It can't sue. It can't own property. You know, it's not a person, according to the law as it stands. So would, if you're passionately pro-life, nothing that I have to say here other than explaining why I don't like abortion is going to be at all acceptable to you. So I guess I should turn it around and say to the people who would like to protect the rights to abortion, how would you feel about just enshrining the principle of self-ownership in the Constitution of the United States so that everybody is the owner of their own bodies? 
Would you be amenable to that? I mean, it, it does take away a few things like, you know, forced labor. Everybody loves forced labor, don't they? You know, as long as you're not the one being forced to labor without recompense. Uh, we, we all like getting free stuff and forced labor is free stuff. Anyway, changing the topic a little bit, yesterday's video, uh, I think last time I looked, it had like 140, 45, something like that views. And I think at least three of them were me just checking comments uh, and over 40 comments, which is to say it got ratioed. Uh, a video or a tweet or whatever is ratioed when it has uh, more comments than it does likes or retweets. And there, there are no retweets on YouTube. So if there are more comments than there are likes, well, then it's been ratioed. <laughs> but it also had a 100% like versus dislike ratio. So nobody gave it a thumbs down. But still, I wonder what the, the YouTube algorithm makes of that. Now, a lot of those comments are me responding to other people's comments. So maybe it's 20 comments on 145 views. Uh, still, I think for YouTube, that's a lot of comments going on you know, for a video which hasn't really been watched by very many people. Uh, but from my perspective, that's great. That's what I like about making these videos is that they do generate comments. They do generate feedback. You know, I can make a podcast that'll get 10 times as many, you know, 10 times as many people will access it and listen to it. But they're not, I guess, when you're listening to a podcast, you're off doing something else. You're not at the keyboard or whatever. Uh, they just don't generate comments for the most part, which... You know, I say I do it for the comments. Of course, I have to make a living. So the money works. <laughs> it's good to get the money. But um, in the short term, you know, the real, the real payment I get from talking into a microphone or into a camera like this is connection and interaction with people who are thoughtful. Now, if this video or yesterday's video had 10 times or 100 times as many views, well, then there'd be a whole bunch of garbage in the comments. There'd be a whole bunch of people just reflexively saying yay or boo and uh, doing it in a, in a very, you know, petty and petulant way. And it would be a chore for me to weed through those comments looking for the good stuff. So I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, for a long time, I really wanted to boost my subscriber count. And, you know, once I got over a thousand, I could monetize. That was nice. Uh, but at this point, you know, really getting a bigger audience on YouTube would kind of spoil what I've got going. Now, I'd certainly love to have a larger podcast audience. That would be great. But uh, for you folks who just check me out here on YouTube, I'm, I'm quite content to just interact with y'all because you leave good comments for the most part. So please keep it up. All right. Talk to you later.